So it's about exploring the heart of theosophy. So defining the heart is something that's you know a challenge. Like we heard from Bernus earlier that we've got two hearts. <laughs> well, we had a lot of experiences with the physical heart, but there's the, the other heart that, that we're really trying to explore in one sense. You know, so it sort of alludes to the fact that real theosophy is within that heart. And the journey to take is to explore that heart. It's difficult because most of us are in our minds, and it's very hard to get to our hearts. It's a world. It's a, it's a world of the mind, really. So, to explore the core of the th of theosophy, you know, I'm going to share with you the view through my lenses of understanding, and hopefully, you'll share some of of your perspectives on these things. But to start with, I, I think there's four important points that we need to take into consideration. So I've put them on slides so that you know, they're fairly clear. And the, the first of those points is that you know, we're a spiritual being having a human experience. So as part of the human experience, we have forgotten our true nature who we really are. So that's an interesting view. So we're a spiritual being having a human experience. So this is a new, this is a saying from the Upanishads. So it's a comes from you know the the Vedic times. So what does it mean we're a human being having a human experience? It's sort of losing oneself. And then finding myself, and then thinking that we've accomplished something when we already are the same as we always were. <laughs> Let's put it very succinctly. It's 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 a good statement. Really, my perception is that we've forgotten who we are. We are spiritual beings. We are a spiritual being. I don't think there's each of us have a spiritual, separate spiritual being. There's just one spiritualness, one spirituality. And we are all, who, who put it, we're all, I think Dorothy said, we're all like God, godlets apart. And there's one God and we're all goblets. So we're all part of that, that one, <laughs> goblets, <laughs> godlets. It's a bit like the the saying from the light of Asia, you know, we're a dew drop, which is part of the sea, and eventually the dew drop falls into the sea, and we realise our oneness again with that sea. So why have we forgotten who we are? And that's the question. So if we are spirit, why don't we know that? They're simple questions, really, aren't they? Yeah, Vicky. Yeah, well, to me, we're um, a spark of the divine, and we've been put into a human body because we have to have a physical body to operate on the earth. And the human, human sorry, animal body, let's call it, um, quickly takes over and says, hey, I'm hungry, I want some food, or, you know, you grow older, you want this and that item of clothing or toy to play with or whatever. And the, the, the this little spark kind of, well, forgets or gets depressed and so on until <laughs> we have time to actually sit back and think, now where was I and what am I meant to be doing here? So we've got so distracted with this, as you say, this animal body or this human body over billions of years perhaps that we've lost the connection to our inner self. So, so if, if you think a little bit about your own lives, where are you focused? So where are you focused? 
largely through the senses. So our, all our attention goes through the, into the senses. So the senses provide are the mechanisms that give us the information. And that information is interpreted by the mind. But we have other ways of perceiving as well. And that, that's what we've lost. Yeah, Chris. Just a thought. We shouldn't be too impatient with ourselves. Those distractions are actually part of the journey. So the soul is here to hone itself through the earthly experience. And if there were never any challenges or distractions, that process wouldn't be happening. So it is all part of the journey. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I said that in order to become a human being, we needed to become self-conscious. And in order to become self-conscious, we had to um, push the boundaries of the material world to become material ourselves. Um, if we're all spiritual beings, we would just be this great mind of spirituality and we wouldn't be here on earth. So Very well we needed seen. to become self-conscious and it yep. was the only way to do it was to acknowledge our ego and develop it through the material world. So this is a part of a huge process. You know, and the pro process we're in at the moment to put it in a nutshell, is developing self-conscious as a, as a human being, which is separate, which sees itself as separate from who it really is. So this is part of our, our journey, so to speak. As we perceive stars separate to light, we also have the chance to be selfish and unselfish. Thank you, Kirsty. One more, and then I'll move on to the next slide. Yeah. When we were spiritual in our, to in our totality, and an aspect splintered off and had another thought, other than who we were as true beings, is it possible that in actual fact we are still whole and complete as a spiritual being, and that that is the dream? And that in an actual fact, there is no learning because we know and we understand everything. It is part of who and what we are as part of our God connection. And perhaps we are just simply asleep. So the dream. Waiting for an awakening. <laughs> and, and to awaken to the fact that we are whole yeah. and we have never been splintered. And that the egoic story was just simply a part of the cosmic joke. <laughs> I think the, the analogy of a dream is a very powerful one. And that, you know, that we are, I think that you say we are spiritual. And that spiritual nature perhaps is having a dream. And this is a result of that dream. And then we go to bed and we have dreams. And, and I, I quite enjoy my dreams. I'm, I'm a person who has adventurous dreams quite often. And then you, know, you, have, you have your dream. You don't like the way it's going. You, know, you might have to get up and go to the bathroom. You don't like the way the dream's going. And I go back to bed and I'll change the way the dream's going. So this is how amazing dreams can be. But how do we know which is the real reality? There's dreams after dreams after dreams. There's an amazing book that I read. It's called the, um, the Yoga Vajishta, which is really a book of stories. It's a, it's a dialogue between um, Vajishta and Rama. Rama, when he was a small child, he just finished his, his schooling and gone for you know, his, his um, trip around India. He went for a trip around India, and he came back very despondent about what he had seen, very, yeah, very despondent. And, and then a dialogue ensued between him and Vajishta, who was his teacher. So I think Vajishta was, a re was a, another name for Krishna. And the dialogue is Vajishta explaining things to him in stories. 
And much of the stories were about people falling into dreams and believing this and believing that and then suddenly waking up and finding themselves another dream and then waking up again and finding themselves yet in another dream. So where is the reality behind all this? And of course Vajishta gave big hints along the way of how to come out of the dreams. And so that was part of, of one's practice that one performs. So dreams are a very powerful analogy. I'll move on to, I've got four points um, to make here. Our awareness is, or well, awareness or consciousness, so I use the terms, the, for me they're both the same, so awareness is just another way of explaining consciousness, is limited through our human modes of perception, namely the mind and the tools of perception and the senses. And I think we've partly sort of looked at this already. So our perceptions are focused generally only outwards. Well, f from my perspective, the real journey is an inward journey, not an outward journey. So this has become difficult for all of us because we're focused so much externally and spend little time on the internal journey, which is a, a real challenge as part of our spiritual journey to learn to focus inwards. Of course, you know, the question is, how do you f learn to focus inwards? So Pantanjali in his Yoga Sutras, he, he developed uh, you know, the sevenfold path. And I think number six, five is, is closing off your senses and then asking yourself the question, where am I? Who am I? So it's prachahara, it's withdrawal from, the, from your senses from earthly life and then going and exploring who you really are. This is quite a powerful, powerful thing to do. A powerful way to find out who you are. So any comments on that one? The only, the only comment I've got is that if, if I'm looking inside, it means I'm not there. Um, and if I'm on a journey, it means I haven't reached where I'm going. So I think it's more important to accept that I'm a spiritual being than to always be searching for it. If I'm searching for it, I'm trying to find something I haven't got. But if I can accept it, that I've got it, then maybe something will happen. That's interesting, yes. Keep remembering we are a spiritual being. Paul asks, what do we mean by spiritual being? I beg your pardon, I spoke without the microphone, my usual degree of enthusiasm. <laughs> what do we actually mean by spiritual? Where does spiritual, where does the physical end and the spiritual begin and the spiritual end? Just to define that. <coughs> Uh, well, that, please, thank you. that could become quite an quite an involved discussion. There, um, you could look at it from many different perspectives. And for example, I think Tim mentioned in his talk, you know, the how you have prakriti and purusha, which are Sanskrit terms for, you know. Purusha is our spiritual nature, Prakriti is material nature, but they're not separate. You can't separate them. You need the spiritual nature to aliven the material nature. Otherwise, the material nature does not have consciousness. So, for me, the spirituality is that, that Purusha part of ourselves, that spiritual nature in ourselves, that's in our every cell, every part of our being. While the material nature is, is, is the form that it holds at any one time. So you are both your physical self and your spiritual self. It's just that we relate mostly just to our spiritual self and not to our, I mean our physical self rather than our spiritual self. Not always, but 
you know, I'm generalizing here. Did that help at all? Let's look at using the Sankhya philosophy to try and explain it. It's, I find the analogy a little bit better as like, you know, we're a, a drop in the ocean. So when we're, eventually we're gonna, we will realize that we are the ocean and not the drop. And at the moment I recognize myself as John Vorstman's and not as so much a godlet. If I called myself godlet, we all call ourselves godlet, we had to talk to it as perhaps, but if we all then recognize that we're just an aspect of God and expressing ourselves as individual godlets, but we're all godlets. So you know, we're all a reflection of the God. So that's another way of looking at it from a totally different perspective. Does that make sense? Oh, over here, Alan. Hello. <laughs> the front row, the men, the front row, and made a very good point. We're on a journey, so there's no, there's no destination, which makes leads me to think a spiritual being is not a destination. A spiritual being is something that changes all the time, and it is is something that we're not. Gonna, you know, it's not sort of a goal we're reaching, or well, it is a goal we're reaching, but it's not a static goal. How about, you know, we are a spiritual being? Yeah. And and the other comment that I liked, which I thought helped with, was uh, Kirsten, I think it was, talked about selfish, I mean, about there was selfishness. Um, I, I would define spirituality as that, but in a positive form, as a state of harmony or compassion. So I think spirituality is being harmonious with whatever you want, others, nature, the world, everything. Or in compassion with nature, the world, or anything. So if we had a harmonious society, like Dorothy says, if we're in a state where everybody loved one another, be a perfect world, it would be, for me, spirituality. So what I'm trying to do is take the human, the spiritual experience and the human thing closer together and bring the spiritual down from that word spiritual which is, has huge connotations in the, sort of, in the Western yeah. world of you know, abuse and goodness knows what all and gold and purple and all that sort of stuff and bring it down to something more tangible like harmony of compassion, and then somebody else was trying to bring humanity up and was talking about the ego, getting rid of the ego, or knowing what the ego is, which was the other thing that really appealed to me about Dorothy's talk, is she was giving us exercises on how to know ourselves, and to know ourselves, the human, we can then develop that thing and, and bring no one down from harmony. And even politicians are interested in harmony. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> And there was someone else, Simon, I think, hit his hand up. All right. So there's some interesting comments there. Like, it's interesting how we attach concepts to words. So when we use a word like spirituality, it has a diff different meanings to different people because of the, the concepts that they've built up over the years. So words become difficult to really communicate in at a at a mental level anyway. And I think to unwind what you mean by spirituality is quite an important journey for, for you all to take. What do you mean by spirituality? I can explain what I think about spirituality. For me it's it's consciousness that has no boundaries. And you know, the human experience is consciousness that has boundaries. Consciousness that is that is limited, awareness that is limited. So no, very interesting. And the next point is that for the majority of of humanity, the mind is controlled by the senses. Example: we sometimes well, it kindles our desires. So we think of something, or we see something. It, kindles our desires, 
And then the next thing you know, we're out getting that in some form or another. So this is, is essentially how the mind tends to work. Well, my mind does. You know, I see. I've, I've said this to you before. You know, I see a new IT tool, and you know, my mind says, "I don't need this tool." No, no. Then I see it advertised somewhere else. No, I don't need this tool. Yeah. Third time comes. Oh, well, maybe. You know, it would be nice. You know, and then before I know it, you know, I've I've bought it, and then I'm saying, "Why did I buy this?" Do, have you experienced that sort of thing? You know, for me, it's. It's technology. For other people, it's other things. Always when it's on special with the crowdfund comes. <laughs> no, specials don't work for me, but... <laughs> so that gives you a bit of an insight into the, the nature of the senses and the mind. So the challenge really is how do we... How do we realize what's going on when this is happening and can you stop it yes, yes. okay thanks yeah it takes effort sometimes so to turn it around the the um the senses are tools of the mind but largely the senses our part of evolution control what the mind is doing. And the idea the ideal is when the senses just become tools of the mind and so the mind becomes the observer and the senses are the tools of observation in this earthly life. And this is part of the challenge of awakening. So we, we can observe what's going on. I can observe what's going on when I see an IT equipment and I can see the nature of, of how my mind works and how it rationalizes. So it doesn't have such a strong effect anymore because I'm observing what's going on. So I'm realizing what's going on. So becoming aware of it. So unless you become aware of it, I wonder if there's any way to manage that because it's a natural process of the mind. So it's, it's, be, it's standing away and be detaching yourself from the process, but observing the process. So you become the observer, rather than the mind itself. As humans, our true nature has become hidden. We have become conditioned beings. Our true nature has become conditioned. We've become conditioned beings. Now this, this has been talked about by I think every speaker almost that's, that's stood up here. What do, I, what, do, what do I mean by conditioned being? It's a bit like the story that Tim told of the snake and the rope. You know, it's a, it's, it's something you see and you infer it to be what it is not because you're not seeing correctly so you're seeing perhaps from memories or past mem experience that you've had so you're inferring that the snake that the, that the rope is a snake because it coils up like a snake coils up perhaps so that's one example of conditioned perception. What if everything we saw was a conditioned perception? How do we know it's not? So this is what I'm finding a challenge as part of my journey today. Like I think when Alan brought up the concept that people might see the concept of spirit is different, then I had to think to myself, yeah, well that's quite possible. Because we have a conditioned perception of spirit. And when Paul asks, you know, what is spirit? 
it makes you really think for yourself. You've got to explore yourself. Melanie. We all come from different backgrounds. Uh, some of us uh, have got a good beneficial background. Others are not so not have, have had a difficult time. There's a different there's a different cultural, the different religious, and it's a matter of seeing all that for what it is, and at times overlooking it. And, and really seeing, trying to see the reality away from all of that. And, and it, it is not easy uh, because we all are all conditioned to think and behave along certain paths. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something which we all struggle with. Uh, we all have, there's times of judgment and prejudices and uh, something which. Uh, None of us like to admit, but, but we all have had, or in a small way, or in a big way, and uh, it's something we all live with. And I think the most important thing, I think, is to see your, con your conditioning or prejudices or judgments for the way they are, and moving through it. It's, it's how you deal with it. Uh, you see it. And you move through it and say, I'm no longer going to think or be like that anymore. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, what I actually found quite helpful was Master Katumi. He talked about spirit as inflowing force. And so we need to, um, depending on how our conditioning is, whether that force, force flows freely and everyone's at different stages of development and so it's up to us to remove those layers or those onion layers for that force to be able to flow. So remove the blockages we'd say in Ayurveda. Yes. Thank you Renee. Maureen? I'm thinking to myself that Rather than spend so much time introspectively, I think it's far more valuable, at least for me, to find out <coughs> what other people think about everything. Not so that I can take on their beliefs, but so that I can understand the whole. When we take more interest in other people, <coughs> we learn more about other people and then can find that we are other people as well. And then we become one with every other in more than just the shallow sense. And I think that finding out more about being a human is valuable if you find out about all those other humans. We all know we're little godlets, we're all little sparks, we're all that. It's more interesting to find out about why we're here, why everybody's here, who everybody is here for, and I work from that. And then, you know, I think it's a lot easier than going inside all the time. Thank you, Maureen. Yeah, everybody's, a, you know, a different aspect of ourselves, and we can learn a lot by, by being aware of and, and being with other people. The question of what is spirit, or spiritual, I see it and feel it as a divine vibration that when receptive, it emanates through us and around us and we can capture that from others as well. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to last because we are entrapped in our minds and our bodies. But given the openness, we will feel it. And no one will have to tell us, because we will know. Thank you. Yes. I think um, that most people have had 
those little aha moment experiences that when suddenly an insight comes to you <coughs> it might be 30 seconds, it might be a split second, suddenly you realise something and it's it, for me that experience is like suddenly I was in a quiet space and suddenly something was able to well up from within me and that f for me was a carrot to search you know, I had an experience once when I had this great insight, you know, and then I started thinking about it and it disappeared. Chum, it was gone. But I remember the experience and this happened in my 20s. I didn't really understood what it was until I was probably in my 40s. And now it's, a, it's a, an insight that's been like a carrot leading me on. So it's, it's a glimpse, for me it's a glimpse of, of my true self, of my higher self, of that part I'm trying to wake up to. And it's insp inspires me to, to keep walking on. Most people have those at different parts of li in their life. But often we don't recognise what they are at the time. Sometimes we just push them aside. But spending the time in looking at those and trying to understand, not understand them, but trying to, to understand where it comes from, why it happens. And you, you can't replicate it because it's something that happens spontaneously. But you can go into a space where that thing can happen, particularly through meditative practices and so forth. It's him. I just find, say John, in those spiritual moments when you get that, don't try to analyze it. Yes, I learned that. Because if you try to analyze it, you get back to your logical mind. Yeah. So if ever you have one of these experiences, any of you, don't analyze it, stay in the moment. You know, it's like looking at a glorious sunset, the minute you turn around to tell somebody else, you've lost it. You know, That's right. If I had this, I was telling somebody today, had this experience, I was thinking of this bird, and this hawk was looking at me straight in the face. And I, for a moment, I thought, wow, I've been thinking of this bird, you know, Horus, it was the Egyptian thing. And then I panicked, thought, oh, what if it attacked me? And, you know, immediately I lost it, because I started to analyze it. If I had just stayed calm, you know, stayed calm, you know, and don't analyze. That's my advice for today. <laughs> so keep the mind still when it happens. Yes. Yeah, hard to do, but yeah. So those are the four questions that I'm basing the rest of what I was going to say on, really. that I think they're important to understand them. It was good to explore them. So what I'm going to now look at is ignorance, knowledge, and wisdom has raised itself up slightly. Which is interesting. <laughs> and the, the, this, this idea came to me from one of my favourite books, is The Voice of the Silence. And right in the beginning of the first f fragment, it, they talk about the hall of ignorance, the hall of knowledge, and the hall of wisdom. And I'm not going to talk about the, the particular the book at all, but I'm just giving you an idea of where this came from for me. That these three seem to be important steps along the process of learning who we are. So the inference is that you know we're living in ignorance. Sort of, it's a bit like the photo. We've all got our head in the sand. <laughs> we have no idea of who we are and what life's about. Did you want to speak? Yes. You say ignorance, is it that or is it innocence? It's, innocence could be another word to describe it, but if, if, if I think of innocence, I think of a child who has just been born and is learning about the world and therefore their, their view of everything 
is intense, so they see everything as it really is. Well, for me, ignorance is that we've stopped seeing things as they really are, but see things through a conditioned response or a conditioned mind. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Ignorance. Yeah, a lot of people say ignorance is sweet, you know. Not knowing is, is, is really good, you know, because once you know, then you've got no choice but to change. So, when I say we live in a world of ignorance, we live in a world that's mainly motivated by, by um, the gaining of possessions, by greed, by selfishness. And you see that you see it everywhere we look, in a sense. And I say this is ignorance because people don't understand that they're not alone in the world, that everybody is part of the reality that they live in. And that is like Kirsty said, it's, it's moving out of ignorance is turning from being selfish to becoming selfless. So that you care about everybody else in the world, how everybody else is going. Now we live in a world where we've got enough food to feed everybody in the world. And what do we do? We live in a world now where fishes are dying because they're eating plastics that we've thrown into the sea. It's come to my attention because some Australians have invented these machines that go into the sea now and they filter the seawater and take all the plastics out of it, which I think is a, is a great thing. But it's, 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 I'm trying to really bring it to ground that why what I see is ignorance here. Because the attention is turned just to ourself. Like in the modern world, success is viewed as you having a, a nice big house, double garage, two cars, or probably three or four cars this day and age. You know, and in New Zealand now you have to pay in excess of a million dollars to buy a house, which is put it out of reach of 75% of young people to be able to buy their own house. So what sort of society is that? So this is, the, this is just highlighting the ignorance. So to get out of ignorance, we go through the next step of knowledge. So will knowledge take us out of ignorance? Knowledge sometimes can be used to increase ignorance. Yes. So it's not just knowledge that's the important thing as this step. So when I talk about knowledge here, it's a specific type of knowledge that needs to be developed to move us out of ignorance. Oh, Chris. I was just going to say that when you link the word discernment with knowledge, that's yeah. how you get the good side of that coin. Excellent. So I, I call it discrimination rather than discernment, but many people transpose those words these days. But the, the knowledge and discrimination have to go together. So the real challenge of knowledge is that we get caught up into the collection of knowledge itself. That we read and we read and we read and we read and we read. Now, especially when we join the Theosophical Society, there's so many books, you know, we, we gobble them all up. But we do it so fast that you know, we don't really take it in. We don't really discern, we don't re really reflect on what we're taking in. So real knowledge is a knowledge that comes from reflection and discernment, discrimination. Yeah. So the, the discrimination is about being able to work out or judge for yourself what is the more true. So discrimination can be defined as, as, as 
defining what is not true and what is true. So that's black and white. I think in the world that we're travelling in, it's ever it's about ever finding the more true, because the truth I find is, is very elusive. So it's part of the the journey of awakening, if we're going to get to, to the wisdom, we've got to be able to see what is real and what is not real. And this becomes the difficulty we face. What is real and what is not real? You know, Dorothy did, did it very well with her floppy disk. You know, I haven't got one. Not a floppy, but I've got a USB stick. Does that <laughs> suffice? You know? The floppy disk, I think, is 512K, while this is 32, 16 gigabytes. So there's a lot of conditioning in there. So how do we, if I go back to the question, how do we know what's true and what's real, unless we are willing to examine what we believe in ourselves? Unless we're willing to look at our perceptions of things, and are they true or are they not true? And that's not for anybody else to do, it's only, only you can do that. Look at what's real and what's not real in your life, in your view. Like even the scientific community is quite good at doing this. Like scientists, they explore things and they, have, they used to have scientific beliefs but they've, they've wisened up and now they have scientific theories because they know that the theory might be disproved sometime and changed. Like, you know, in, in 600 BC the Greek philosophers thought that the, 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 the universe revolved around the Earth, that the Earth was the centre of the universe. And that was the predominant belief until Ptolemy's <coughs> came along and explained, well he, he even believed in this, and then in 1543 Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus came up with a new theory that, you know, that our Earth revolved around the Sun. So for hundreds of years, thousands of years, everyone believed that the Earth was the centre of the universe. Then suddenly that belief was pulled out from under their feet. So this was a conditioned belief until a scientist explored this more deeply and found what the truth was, that the Earth revolves around the Sun. And this hasn't been disproved yet, so it's the current theory. And then, you know, we had the, another one which was you know, prior to the middle of the 20th century, science believed that the Earth's continents were stable and did not move. So that, you know, North America was always where North America was, New Zealand was always where New Zealand was, and so forth. And then, in 1912, Alfred Wegener's formulation of the continental drift theory became popular. So that the continents are drifting, and this is where the, the theory of Gondwala land came in, which is a bit, which suggests that you know, originally there was just one big land mass on the earth, and over millions of years that land mass split up, and that makes up New Zealand, Australia, India, America, and so forth, which is the current the current theory, and this was further confirmed by the theory of plate tectonics, which was first discovered or first theorised in New Zealand when a group of geologists found that the, the, there was a movement of the earth where the, in the South Island where the Alpine was and that they were moving so much, so many millimetres per year. And this is, this is where the theory of plate tectonics came into being. So it's interesting how science is able to look at what it believes, question what it believes, 
and willing to change its beliefs based upon its findings. But how good are we at doing that ourselves? We have beliefs. How good are we at looking at our beliefs and actually questioning and and come to and come to see whether they're true or not? Now, who said it today that you know, the the Buddha said not to believe everything or anything he said until you got prove it for yourself, until, or unless you felt it was true. That was Tim I hear. Anyhow. And this is an important to do. So it's, it, this is one of the things that we often talk about in theosophy, that it's important to be able to verify these things for yourself. In fact, in, in some ways, the freedom of thought declaration that was a th is based on that, that every member has a right to accept or reject anything that we talk about. But it doesn't really stop there. If you take it at a deeper level, it also implies that you know, we need to look at what we believe and what we don't believe. Because how can we really know what's true and what's not true unless we examine it for ourselves? Now, this <coughs> diagram is interesting in another way. It's like the story of of spiritual unfoldment, let's say. It's the story of awakening. I was with Ravi Ravinda some years ago at a conference and he spent a bit of time with Krishnamurti and he, Ravi was always of the belief that, you know, to evolve spiritually was a progressive process. You had to develop the right sort of body, you had to develop the right sort of mind and then over incarnations your vehicle would evolve so that you can realize the spiritual nature. So he asked Krishnamurti this question. And Krishnamurti's response was, no, the journey isn't from here to there. The journey is from there to here. Which sort of turns the whole thing the other way around, really. But when you think, if you think for a minute that, yes, we are spiritual beings. And we've just forgotten it. So this, and as Krishnamurti says, this, the journey is from the spirit, from there to here. And I guess he's talking from his experience, because he had, you know, he had a big aha moment in his life, in no high sitting under a pepper tree. And that changed his perception of reality. So he's talking from a perspective that I don't have. I, need, I can only try to understand and try and, and get there myself. So how, do you, how does this fit with you? Does this give you any insights? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Mm. Yes, Maureen. I think in my awkward way, that was kind of the point I was trying to make. You know, forget about the there, it's here. And everybody else, once you get a handle on your own life, it's understanding everybody else and their viewpoints. And then balancing them with your own, so there's no conflict. That way, you can get to understand everybody's point of view without disharmony. Mm. Possibly except for husbands, they're a different kettle of fish. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I disagree with you on the husband part. You know, I think partners are, the, are your, your greatest gifts in life, because they challenge us and they get us to see, to look at ourselves. <laughs> they get us to see our conditioning. I, I read a, a book once by Paulo Coelho. I hope I pronounced his name right. He wrote a book called The Pilgrimage. His most famous book is The Alchemist, but I think The Pilgrimage is best. And he talks about, you know, he's Brazilian and lived in Brazil, and he talks about going forward to his initiation 
So he'd been trained by the spiritual teacher in Brazil. And all the students were ready to go forth and through their initiation and collect their sword, which was their sort of badge of, of reaching that stage of their spiritual journey. They all got their sword until he got up there and then he said, no, you're not ready for your sword yet. And he didn't get his sword. So after the, the, the initiation, he went and saw his teacher and says, well, why didn't I get a sword? Well, his teacher said, you're not ready for it. He said, to get your sword, you've had to go on a journey. And the sword will be at the end of the journey. So the journey was walking the Camino Trail in northern Spain. So he had to walk the Camino Trail, and at the end of the Camino Trail, I understand there's a church. In fact, I've, from the movies I've seen, I know there's a church, and that's where a sword will be. So he um, started the journey. He wasn't very happy about this, I can tell you. He was very displeased that he didn't get a sword. And he started the journey, and he had a guide, and the guide was going to take him with the way he has to go. But he didn't want a guide, he just wanted to get there as quickly as he could. So he ignored the guide and just walked and walked and walked. And after a few days, he realised he was going around in circles. You know? So you know, this is an interesting story about guides here. So the whole of his journey was a huge lesson for him. So every part of his journey, every day he came across different challenges. And he tried to ignore the challenges and just move on. But the challenges themselves were a huge teaching. And when he understood this, he began to wake up to what the journey was really about. So in the end, he realised the journey wasn't about the destination. It was about what happens to you at every step along the road. And in the end, he didn't really... I don't know if he ever finished there and claimed a sword, because the sword was no longer something that he desired. The sword is interesting. The sword is the symbol of discrimination. So it's, 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 it's a very interesting book to read in the, in the light of our own spiritual journey. Now we're going from ignorance to knowledge. And how do you get to wisdom? No. In, in The Voice of the Silence, HPB says, and I'm paraphrasing here, that uh, to get to the Hall of Wisdom, you've got to let go of the knowledge that you've learnt. Because it's, and for me, this is letting go of your conditioning, what you've conditioned yourself with. Because it's only when you drop your conditioning that the wisdom arises within you. So how do we know the knowledge that we have it's true knowledge, you know. So awakening to the heart of theosophy begins when we have developed true discrimination and open ourselves up to our inner understanding, when true insight is reawakened. This is the goal of our journey, which is the result of correct perception, active inquiry, and in alignment with our human nature and true universal values. So when I talk about what's the heart of theosophy, it's not in the book, sadly, because most of us would like to, to read what it is. It's not something that somebody else can tell you. And mainly because even if they told us, we, would, we wouldn't hear what they're trying to tell us. We'd hear what we think they were trying to tell us through our own conditioning. So the the journey to find the heart of theosophy is to unwind ourselves so that we hear what the message really is. And this is, I think, what everybody's been talking about over, over this last day anyway, is to unwind ourselves, question what we really believe, explore ourselves. Yes. The actual answer is with it. It is. The only way to 
to find that wisdom that comes through that heart that Bernice was talking about is to remove everything that's in the way, to open ourselves up for it. So that's, this is an analogy for a process. So words cannot describe it. Um, it's, it's spending time just perhaps in your meditations, placing your awareness in your heart is a good step to, tr to learn to open the heart, to be in the heart. It's not an intellectual process so much, it's a, it's a journey of, of um, being willing to explore what is real and being willing to question things that you come across. In The Golden Stairs by H. P. Vasquez, she talks about an open mind, a pure heart, an eager intellect, an unveiled spiritual perception. These are the qualities, these are the keys to where we're trying to go. So I'm going to close shortly. We've got time for one more question, perhaps Kirsty had her hand up. I had an experience with seeing different colours in this space that is never empty. What I learned was that other people can be looking at the same not empty space and we are literally seeing different things. Yeah, it's a good point. I always wondered everybody saw yellow the same as I saw yellow. That sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know. You know, like, see different clairvoyants. They see the chakras in different colours. I find that interesting too, you know, so these are all very subjective things. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a journey to take. It's a journey of self-discovery. So that's why I find Theosophy the greatest adventure that we can ever go on, because it opens itself up all the time. There's no answers except the answers you find for yourself. So to move from where we are, to find you know, the heart of theosophy is a pilgrimage or a journey that we have to take. It's not something that can be learned by listening to somebody else speak. So I'll leave you with those thoughts and I hope I kept you awake for the, the last hour.